The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Uh, so, uh, hope everyone is okay. Hope you are uh, enjoying yourself. And uh, I'm going to continue with some uh, looking at some suttas, uh, some of the words of the Buddha that actually have to do with meditation practice, how to develop the mind, uh, and these kind of things. Uh. And these are suttas that I often look at at meditation <coughs> retreats uh, uh, because they are kind of fundamental. They are things that are spoken about often uh, by the Buddha, and because they're spoken about often, uh, they can be considered important issues, important uh, topics to, to be dealt with. Uh. And this is one of the kind of, I think, important ways of thinking about the suttas is to decide, well, which ones are actually, would actually, which ones matter? Which ones are the important ones? Uh, how do we make decisions about that? Uh, and uh, one way, traditionally, for example, to give an example, uh, traditionally the Satipatthana Sutta is said to be very important in Buddhist circles. Uh, but instead of just accepting that as such, uh, it is often useful to ask yourself, well, why exactly is the Satipatthana Sutta important? Is there any reason for that apart from popular opinion? And uh, when you look at the suttas overall, the Satipatthana Sutta really is only one sutta among many. Uh, and the, the Buddha never really says that it has any particular significance. Uh, so I would say that Satipatthana Sutta is just as important, uh, neither less nor more, uh, as other suttas. Uh, so what you have to do to decide if a sutta is important or not, you have to look at whether that particular topic is talked about often in the suttas, yeah? whether it's something the Buddha mentions often uh, to different people uh, in different settings, uh, very often maybe with slight variations, uh, yeah, the same topic with slight variations. Uh, and if, uh, this is, uh, if something is very common, uh, then you can be quite sure that it is an important topic uh, uh, as, uh, uh, from the Buddha's point of view. Uh, and one of this particular sutta I'm talk, going to talk about now is one of these suttas uh, that uh, uh, you find a lot uh, uh, across the range of you know, collections, the Anguttara Nikaya, the Sangyutta Nikaya, the various collections. Uh, and this particular sutta is called the Chaitana Sutta. Uh, and it shows the development of meditation from a first-person point of view. Uh, what it's supposed to feel like when meditation develops in the right way. Uh, it gives a sequence of factors, uh, yeah, how, how actually uh, the meditation progresses. Uh. And this particular sequence is important because it exists in its own right in many places. Uh. Sometimes it's called dependent liberation, that's the kind of title I like for that particular sutta. Uh. But it's also very similar to the seven bojangas. Uh. Yeah, seven bojangas is one, uh, is one of the sets of 37 bodhipakya dhammas, uh, bodhipakya dhammas being the 37 aids to awakening, uh, one of these important sets in Buddhism uh, that brings together all the various aspects of the path into one, uh, 37 aspects altogether. Uh. So the bojangas are part of these 37, and these 37, uh, they are said by the Buddha himself to be the, essentially the Dhamma. This is the teachings. Yeah? You go to the Mahaparinibbana Sutta and uh, the Buddha says, after I pass away, uh, you should remember this Dhamma and pass it on to the next generation out of compassion and for the happiness and welfare of gods and humans. Uh, and what are my teachings? And he says they are the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas. Uh, yeah, so these very practical teachings on how to develop the path uh, and essentially they kind of come down to the Noble Eightfold Path uh, again to simplify it even more. Uh, so seven bojangas, seven factors of awakening, they are part of the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas. They are a crucial element uh, of the Buddha's path to awakening. Uh, and it's very similar to this particular sutta here, similar kind of theme. Uh, and then you look at things like the Anapanasati Sutta, which is also a, a a type of meditation that is talked about very often in the suttas. Uh, and again, the sequence of factors there, uh, you know, which includes all the various joys and the uh, contemplation of mind and all of these kind of things, uh, is also very similar to this particular sequence. Uh, so this is something that kind of recurs around the suttas in various ways and various uh, slight variations. Uh, and it is often the slight variations that make it interesting uh, because they broaden out uh, your understanding of what this uh, particular way of looking at uh, reality or the mind, what it actually means and how, it, how, it, uh, how you're supposed to do it. Uh. 
So this is how you decide that the sutta is important. Yeah? So this is why I reckon, I reckon this sutta is important. And it's also very uplifting, a, a very positive sutta. It doesn't start off by saying, this is dukkha. It pretty much starts off the exact opposite. This is sukkha, that's what it starts off. It doesn't actually say that directly, but something like that. It's a very positive kind of sutta. And this is, uh, I think, uh, uh, this is if, if you want to sell the Dhamma, you have to sell it in a uh, way that people actually can comprehend it. And sometimes if you emphasize dukkha too much, people say, okay, I don't want to go anything to do with Buddhism, too much, too much su suffering, too much dukkha, so I'll go with, go with the sukkha instead. So if we can promote Dhamma as sukkha, then so much better here. So this is the, um, this little discourse. I'm going to read it out. It's very simple. Uh, it's very easy to follow. So it's not that you don't really need the paper yourself. Uh, but if you are interested in reading it later on, on your own accord, it's found in the uh, Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses, uh, in the book of tens. Uh, yeah, if you, uh, ten, the Anguttara Nikaya is divided into books. On it ones, twos, threes, up to the tens and the elevens. Uh, this is the tens, and it's the second sutta in the tens, uh, this particular one here. And this is what it, uh, what it reads like. Uh, uh, bhikkhus, monks. <laughs> it's interesting, yeah, bhikkhus, does that mean that it's only for bhikkhus? Uh, in that case, I have to stop there. That's why I stopped, it heard me, wait a minute. <laughs> There's only one bhikkhu here, I can't just read to myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, the point here, and I just want to kind of bring out this point straight away, that when the Buddha, Buddha says bhikkhus, uh, it is not an exclusive thing that it's only for the bhikkhus. Uh, because very often the uh, people who were present would have, been very, uh, would have been a complex congregation of people. There would have been bhikkhus, there would have been bhikkhunis. Uh, sometimes the Buddha says bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. Uh, uh, sometimes there would have been lay people present, uh, yeah, upasakas and upasakas. Uh, uh, because, and the reason why it is always said uh, to the bhikkhus in this way is that according to the way things were done at that time, according to the social customs, uh, you would address things to the most senior people present. Uh, and they would have been the bhikkhus because they were ordained first, they started out first, and then everything else arose afterwards. Uh. So uh, please don't feel excluded because just because you're not a bhikkhu, you are still included in this. Uh. So. Um, because the lay people would often come to the monastery on the Uposita days, and then they would listen to discourses just like everyone else. And um, there are even certain cases of certain discourses that were only known to lay people. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you are aware of this, uh, but the, uh, there is, uh, for example, the Itivuttaka, one of the books of the Kudaka Nikaya, was, was rem all the suttas there were remembered by a lay, a lay woman. Uh, yeah, and nobody else seemed to know about those suttas, uh, so they had somehow been transmitted to her, and she was the one who knew about it. Uh, in the uh, uh, Vinaya uh, Pitaka, uh, yeah, the Vinaya Pitaka is all about the rules and all about the part, the aspects that have to do with the monastic life and how to do things in monastic life. Uh, and in there it says under a chapter had to do with the Katina, the Katina being the ceremony you do after the rains, rains retreat. Uh, in there, there is a special allowance. Uh, if you are under the rains retreat uh, and you, uh, and uh, uh, suddenly it, it, there are certain allowances for leaving the rains retreat, uh, and one of those allowances is if a lay person says, Oh, there's a sutta, I know this sutta, I don't want it to disappear, I need to transmit it to you. Uh, yeah, then you are allowed to leave the rains retreat for that basis. Uh. So uh, there are many, a number of cases where actually sutta seem to have been known only to lay people uh, and not actually to. Uh, monks at all, which is kind of interesting here. Uh, so sometimes the Buddha would have taught the lay people directly as well here. Uh. Anyway, bhikkhus, uh, for a virtuous person, for one whose behavior is virtuous, uh, uh, no, no will is required, or uh, no will is required, let non-regret arise in me. Uh. It is natural that non-regret arises in a virtuous person. Uh, one whose behavior is virtuous. For one without regret, no volition, there is no, no will to be exerted. Let joy arise in me. It is natural that joy arises in one without regret. For one who is joyful, there is no need to, for will uh, to think, let rapture arise in me. It is natural that rapture arises in one who is joyful. For one with a rapturous mind, 
No will is required to think, let my body be tranquil. It is natural that the body of one with a rapturous mind is tranquil. For one tranquil in body, there is no will that is required to think, let me feel pleasure. It is natural that one tranquil in body feels pleasure. For one feeling pleasure, no will is required to think, let my mind be stilled, concentrated, it says here. It is natural that the mind of one feeling pleasure is stilled. For one who is stilled, no will is required to think, let me know and see things as they really are. It is natural that one who is stilled knows and sees things as they really are. And then it goes on, just to the last part here. For one who knows and sees things as they really are, no will is required. Let me be uh, disenchanted and dispassionate. It is natural that one who knows and sees things as they really are is disenchanted and dispassionate. For one who is disenchanted and dispassionate, no will is required. Let me realize the knowledge and vision of liberation. It is natural that one who is dischanted and dispassionate uh, realizes the knowledge and vision of liberation. Uh. Thus, because one stage flows into the next stage, uh, one stage fills up the next stage uh, for going from the near shore to the far shore. Uh. In other words, from going from uh, uh, ordinary existence to becoming an arahant. Uh, that's what that is about. Uh. So, um, what do you think? Yeah? You think boring? Is that what you think? Yeah? Re repetitive, perhaps? Uh, yeah? One same thing, one thing after the other, almost exactly the same. Uh, and of course, the idea, one of the nice things about that, you get into this quite nice rhythm, and you can focus on those things that are really stand out. The difference between uh, from one link to the next one, they stand out very strongly. Uh, and you can see the sequence in things here, one thing leading to the next one, uh, which is kind of the purpose of this whole, uh, this whole thing here. So what this is about, uh, this is about uh, the ideal way that we are supposed to experience the meditation. Uh, yeah, the meditation kind of uh, uh, progresses in this way. Uh, so it is like a, a psychology, if you like, of meditation. Uh, and it is a map that maps out the terrain for you, so that when you do your meditation practice, uh, when it starts to go well, uh, you know what it is that you have to look for. Uh, and if these things are happening, uh, then uh, your meditation is going well. Uh, if these things are not happening, uh, if you kind of get blocked or you stop at a certain point, uh, that is where you have then to look and you have to find out what is it, what's the reason why meditation is not progressing here. Uh. So very important to have a map, right? So we know whether what we're doing is right or not, uh, whether we're heading in the right direction. Uh, so, so useful. It's one of the things about the Buddha. He explains these teachings or the idea of the Buddhist path from many different angles. Uh, and one of the angles is how you're supposed to experience it. Uh, another angle is what you're supposed to do, yeah? how we kind of practice to get, uh, get going on this path. In other words, uh, when he talks about the sila and then the sense restraint and then the meditation practice, uh, it's how you what you kind of do to make progress on this path. Uh, so always different angles, different perspectives that give you a very complete picture after a while. Uh. So remember this map, yeah? And uh, this map is not something that you need to think about in meditation. No need to think whether you're actually doing this uh, right or not. Uh, you just have it at the back of your mind, uh, and then you know whether you're going in the right direction or not. Uh, you can see whether it's heading this way. You know your suttas, you know the sequence so well that you know whether it's kind of going in the right direction or not. Uh, and it's quite a simple sequence. Uh, one of the really astonishing things about this sequence, uh, which always I found kind of the most uh, inspiring thing about this, is this incredible emphasis on happy states of mind. Yeah, everything is about happiness almost all the way through, uh, starting with like non-regret. Uh, and of course, non-regret is kind of a happy state of mind, or at least the lack of suffering. Uh, and then from that, it then goes on one thing after the other, from joy to rapture to tranquility, uh, to happiness and eventually to samadhi and then seeing things in accordance with the reality. Uh, and one thing is a greater state of happiness than the previous one. Uh, it's all about happiness. Uh, that's what meditation is about. Uh, yeah, and this is why the Buddha, when I, I mentioned this morning about the sutta with the uh, uh, Bodhi Raja Kumara Sutta, uh, where the Buddha speaks to Prince Bodhi, uh, 
And Prince Bodhi says that you, you gain happiness through suffering. Uh, and the Buddha says, that's what I used to think too. Uh, but I don't think that any longer. Uh, now I know that happiness is to be attained through happiness. Uh, and this is what is going on here. Each stage of happiness leads to a higher stage of happiness. Uh, it's just incredibly positive message. Uh, yeah? Happiness leading to happiness. Uh, it's not how we tend to think about the world, uh, it, but this is actually how the Buddhist path works. Uh. Of course, it means that you have to be very careful, you have to uh, define happiness in the right way. Uh, this is not just any kind of happiness. Uh, these are the spiritual happinesses, the happiness that are hard to have to do with tranquility and peace and all of these kind of things. Uh, but if you pursue the right kind of happiness, uh, then this path works in this way, and it works accordingly. Uh. So what a, what a wonderful thing that is, that you have a path that is all about happiness all the way along. Yeah. So um, uh, one happiness being greater than the, the next one. Yeah. And it's one of Adam Brahm's books, which it was, was called, uh, um, what was it called? Bliss Upon Bliss Upon Bliss? Or was that a, a, something like that? Somebody, yeah, anyway. So actually, that's not the book, name of the book, that's what he says, I think, in the book. I, I can't remember now. Yeah. Anyway, so, uh, and this is kind of the idea, this kind of, evolution of happiness as you practice this path. Uh. And that evolution of happiness, uh, what is kind of fascinating about it here, is this idea that they, they bring up here when it says, and this translation says, no volition need be exerted. Uh, but actually I never really agreed with that translation. Uh, uh, first of all, the word volition is very technical. It means like will. Uh, no will needs to be exerted. Uh, but actually, the Pali doesn't really say quite that. Uh, what it says is, it says, na chetanaya karaniya. This is not to be done by volition or by an act of will. Uh, which is quite different from saying that the will is not needed. Uh, it says, this cannot be done through an act of will. Uh, this doesn't happen through an act of will. Uh, and if it doesn't happen through an act of will, how does it happen? Uh, it happens as a natural progression, one leading to the next one, all by itself. Uh, and that's why it says further down, it's dhammata, it's according to dhamma, it's according to the laws of nature, that this must happen. Uh, yeah, it's kind of really, really nice. All you have to do, in other words, there's no, if there's no will required, uh, it means that all you have to do uh, is you have to sit back uh, and you have to wait for these things to arise. Uh, and then if you kind of are able to really wait uh, and really able to relax and allow these things to be, all of these states uh, come by themselves. Uh, easy. Yeah, it's supposed to be really easy. If it isn't easy, it is because something hasn't, uh, uh, hasn't kind of, you haven't started out right, you haven't done something right at the beginning. Uh, but the actual meditation itself uh, is supposed to be incredibly easy and relaxed. Uh, and just having all of these qualities arise all by themselves. Uh, no will is required. Uh, in fact, the will gets in the way. If this is in accordance with nature, uh, if you try to force nature, uh, if you try to take that little plant and pull it up, to, we want to make it grow faster, uh, then you have a problem. Uh, you're, gonna, you're trying to go counter to nature. Uh, and if you try to go counter to nature, uh, you're going to destroy that fragile uh, state of peace and happiness that you have, uh, and it's not going to work out. Uh. So will is a problem. Yeah, the willpower doesn't work. Uh, so just let that will be. Uh. So what does that mean in terms of our meditation practice? Uh? And what it means is that you have to learn to be the passive observer. Uh. Yeah, we often talk about the passive observer in uh, Buddhism, but here this is exactly what it means. Uh. You have to learn to stand back uh, and just be aware and just enjoy what is going on without being involved at all. Uh. And uh, I learned this beautiful simile. This comes from Ajahn Brahm. So much of what I say comes from Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, I've been thoroughly brainwashed by Ajahn Brahm. Uh, <laughs> the kind of I just regurgitate things automatically coming back. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Ajahn Brahm always had this beautiful simile of being like a passenger on a train. Uh. Yeah, when you are a passenger uh, on the train, you have no say in how fast the train goes. Uh. You have no say in where the, f where the train is going to go. Uh. You have no say whether the train should go left or right at the next junction. Uh. When you're a passenger, you just sit in the seat and you observe the landscape outside. Uh. You see what is happening. And if the landscape is ugly, you just shrug your shoulders. You don't start complaining to the driver. Uh. Or do you? Maybe you do. I don't know. <laughs> that would be something, yeah? Hey, driver, this is not good. Go somewhere else. Usually you just accept it because you know the train has to go from A to B. Yeah? So you sit back and whatever is happening, you kind of accept that and there's no problem. So you look at the landscape outside. 
So you can imagine your breath or whatever you are using as your meditation object is like the landscape outside. You allow your breath to be here. You stand back, you have a sense of distance between yourself and the breath and you just allow that breath to be and then you follow it along as a passive observer of what is happening here. And it is surprising how difficult it can be here to be a passive observer. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so easy to get involved in the breath. As soon as the kind of the, you have the breath there, you are very, because your mind maybe has a tendency to, all minds, most minds, not maybe all, but most minds have a tendency to kind of drift away from the breath, uh, to think about things, to do this and to do that. Uh, so because after a while, and you, we all lack patience to some extent, it's very hard to find people who are 100% patient. Uh, so because of that, there always comes a point when we cling on a little bit to the breath. Uh, we hold on a little bit. Uh, and the moment you start attaching a little bit to the breath, uh, you try to hold on to it, uh, you don't feel as at ease anymore. You start to feel a bit tense. Uh, you know what I mean? The breath isn't as beautiful as it should be. Uh, it loses some of its marvelous and peaceful qualities. Uh, and that is because you're not able to really let go and allow it to be. Uh, and uh, the reason why we do that is because we are, you know, one of the things that we identify with as part of our self, uh, is the doer, is this agency. We are the agents in our lives. Uh, yeah, we are creators and makers and doers. Uh, this is one of the very profound aspects of the sense of self. Uh, so it is very natural for us to express that sense of self uh, because when you express it, actually, it makes you feel alive. If, if you take that to be you, uh, and uh, the you is the doer, uh, then whenever you express the sense of self, you feel that you are alive. You indulge that sense of existence. Yeah, I exist. Yay, I create. I do. Uh, I sort things out. I make my breath you know, be just right. Uh, and that uh, tendency to do that is very powerful because we identify so strongly with the sense of self. Uh, just being a passive and just not doing anything actually is quite hard for most people. Uh, not because it is... Uh, uh, you know, when, once you get the hang of it, not, not that it is difficult to do, it's just that the habits are so strong uh, to be involved with everything. Uh, it's actually quite hard just to sit back and allow things to be here. Uh. So uh, uh, it's useful sometimes to kind of reflect a little bit on the uselessness of the doer, uh, the uselessness of all this creative activity uh, and how much we create and at the end it doesn't really make that much difference uh, and how much more conducive often it is to happiness just to let all that be here, uh, just allow it be here. Uh, Sit back and observe and just allow the bliss to arise in the mind without doing anything at all. And this, you learn that gradually by trial and error, how not to get involved. And life tends to be much easier if we don't get involved so much. If we go with the flow, we flow with things in life rather than always resist and always kind of make decisions about things. That's why I was a bit disappointed there was no clear program for me this morning. Uh, I had to make it myself. It means I have to dis make decisions again. I thought, don't really want to make any decisions. But uh, there, there you are. It's a small, very small thing here. So uh, you kind of just go with the flow. Don't really make, you know, you just kind of, and this is kind of one of the nice ways of flowing through life. Uh, and you learn to kind of disentangle all this doing a little bit, uh, which is so wonderful. And you start to get the results of that in a meditation practice. Uh, and it's also very interesting, so much of that doer is becoming more and more obvious also through uh, scientific experiments, how uh, little of that doer actually is real, how, how realistic it is. It feels like we do things, uh, but the feeling of doing usually comes after the action has already been done or after the idea has already been decided. Uh, yeah, this is one of some of those very fancy experiments they have done on the mind, uh, measure the kind of, um, what is it, the... Um, choice potential in the mind or whatever it is. Uh, and that choice is made in the mind and a few tens of a second later on you feel, yeah, I did that. Uh, it's already done. You didn't do anything. It's already happened. Uh, yeah? And these kind of experiments, they kind of uh, confirm the Buddhist idea of how much this doing is actually an illusion. Uh, it doesn't really happen. Uh, it happens because of cause and conditions. The choice is made and afterwards you think, yeah, I did it. Uh, you take credit credit afterwards, uh, yeah? That someone else did the work and then you take credit afterwards. Uh, that's really what's happening. Yeah? Who is that someone else? It was just nature, five khandhas coming together. Yeah? So you allow that will to die down. Uh, you realize that it, is, uh, it isn't really uh, all that it is uh, uh, sometimes said to be. Uh, and uh, so you allow it to kind of fade out and you learn to become this passive observer. Uh, this is one of the main kind of uh, 
purposes of this particular sutta, to bring out this idea of being passive and not driving your meditation, but allowing the meditation to happen. Uh, the more you, you get out of the way, uh, the more ability the meditation has to take its own course uh, and just develop according to nature. Uh. So that is the um, uh, that is kind of some of the main points of this particular sutta. Uh, yeah, what it is about. Uh, uh, but of course, what is very interesting about this, and one of the things that uh, we need to talk about, obviously, is if this is a natural process, uh, why doesn't it work? Why is it that most people, they sit back and they lean back and they relax and they do whatever, why is it that they don't just bliss out and go into samadhi? Huh? Yeah, why, what, what is actually stopping that? Huh? And what is stopping that is because we here have this condition sequence, the first and the last factors are by far the most important ones. Yeah? So what is the first factor in this sequence? It's sila. So if this sequence isn't happen, happening by itself, and especially after you have kind of calmed down a little bit from all the restlessness and you have kind of chilled out for a while just to feel relaxed and at ease or whatever, if the process does, then doesn't work, it is because you haven't yet built up your sila, built up your morality, built up your character, built up your habits in such a way that it actually allows the process to come out. This is why sila is first here. And this shows you, once again, you know, we often talk about Buddhism, about uh, how important sila is to enable us to practice this life fully. And again, it shows you, it is the foundation stone for meditation practice. Uh, without that, meditation can never really give great benefits and get great results. Uh, and this is, uh, again, one of the weaknesses of so much of the secular meditation, where they take mindfulness out of the... Sev of the uh, uh, noble Eightfold Path, uh, and they leave the other seven factors there, uh, and they use that as a thing in its own right, uh, which is separate from the other factors. Uh, it can still be beneficial, uh, but it will only be tiny, tiny benefit. I will have a tiny, tiny benefit uh, compared to the mindfulness that you develop as part of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, yeah, when you do the uh, virtue part and you do all of the other factors in the right way. Also, right view, by the way, is another very important part of this. When all of that comes together, that's when it becomes very powerful. So remember the virtue part of things. The Pali word here, which it lies behind virtue, as you would know, is sila. Yeah, so, and the Pali word sila doesn't necessarily mean virtue. It means much more than that. It can mean things like character, or it can mean things like... Uh, you know, your habits and all of these kind of things. Uh, and all of that is part of what is called sila in Buddhism. It's the development of your entire character. Uh, so, you know, so for that reason, you have to look very broadly. What kind of person are you? What are your weaknesses? Uh, how can you kind of uh, become maybe a better person, not only externally, how you show yourself to the world uh, by speech and by action, uh, that's already difficult enough, uh, but also internally. Uh, what are your internal mind states like? Uh, do they tend to be kind and generous? Uh, do they tend to be, have sympathy and understanding? Uh, are you slow in judging or are you quick in judging other people? Uh, yeah? All of these things are part and parcel of what we hear called sila, because it goes to a very profound level. Uh, and it's only when you get all of these things right, uh, yeah, and you purify all of these things, uh, that they become a really powerful source uh, for support in your meditation practice. Uh, so in Buddhism, we have to be very honest with ourselves. Uh, if you're not honest with yourself, uh, you are not. You may very well uh, block yourself from making progress on this path. Uh, so you have to be very honest uh, and actually see, accept yourself for who you are, see your weaknesses. Uh, and as you do that, you start to unravel the problems, uh, the bottlenecks in the path that stop you from going much deeper in your practice. Uh, it's very demanding, yeah. Buddhism is really demanding. Uh, the Buddha doesn't kind of say, yeah, you know, there's nothing to be done. Sometimes it says that when you sit down in your meditation. Uh, but in terms of kind of practicing virtue, really, really demanding. Uh, and uh, for that reason, you have to be really committed to this path. Uh, if you want the full benefits, uh, you need super duper commitment. Uh, without that super duper commitment, uh, it's not going to work out. Uh, you really have to kind of get into this. Uh, so you 
really try to overcome your irritations and angers. You try to overcome excessive desires. You try to overcome kind of silly views about the world. You start to figure out where real happiness is to be found. You think about the world in the ways that the Buddha suggests we should think about the world. And gradually, gradually, you start to change. And it's beautiful when that happens. Yeah, I've been a monk for 23 years, and I've seen this happening in myself over a long period of time, and it's such a beautiful thing. When you start to see, you become more content, you have more time for other people, more kindness, you judge much more slowly, tend to accept people for who they are much more. I'm not suggesting that I'm perfect, far from it, but I've gone a long way from where I started out. I'm very glad you have no idea where I started out, because that would be really kind of really scary. But I've gone, I've gone a long way, yeah. And I'm happy to see that I have progressed. And this gives you such encouragement. And you see the whole thing kind of in movement. And in part, that has been because I have said to myself, okay, how can I, how, what can I do to change myself and become a better person? And this is really what it is about. So virtue, yeah, the essential component, ingredient at the beginning of the path. I'll have a little bit more look at that tomorrow. Uh, when we talk a little bit about metta tomorrow, uh, and that is kind of part of that as well, uh, uh, how to develop this further. Uh. So uh, that is where the problem is, and that is where the bottleneck is. Uh, and uh, I, you know, if your meditation isn't going very deep, it uh, doesn't mean that you're a bad person. Uh, yeah? Don't think, I'm not trying to say that because your meditation is bad, you are a bad person. Yeah? This is not kind of the point of this. Uh, the point of this is that most of you here already are very good people, otherwise you wouldn't be here. The point rather is that we can always improve further, huh? we can always do more, yeah? and this is kind of what this is about. We can always have more metta, we can always have more kindness. It's almost impossible to have too much metta. Yeah? I, it, it's, you can always build up more because the, the, the level, you know, the degree to which we can go is absolutely astonishing. Yeah? So for that reason you can always have more of these qualities, uh, you can build them up more. Uh, so if you don't feel that you have, you know, your meditation is going very bad, not going tremendously good, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, you are a bad person. It just means that there is a, always more things you can do to improve yourself even further. Uh, and this is kind of one of the things when we talk about, you know, sila again, it's important to realize that uh, one aspect of the sila is the negative aspect. Uh, you try to avoid doing the bad things. Uh, but a very important part of sila is actually doing the good things. Yeah? Knowing how to treat people in the right way, speak in the right way, think in the right way, perceive even in the right way. And that is also a very important part of this character development. And then all of these various aspects come together and then they become really powerful as a consequence. So that is the beginning point of the path. So the beginning point, obviously very important when it is an automatic sequence like that. But the end point too is quite interesting. In this case the end point is uh, uh, knowledge and vision of liberation, vimutti uh, nanadasana, and that is kind of far away, yeah, for most people anyway, it's kind of a kind of long way down the track. Yeah. Um, but uh, on the way to that vimutti nanadasana at the very end, uh, we have samadhi. Yeah. Samadhi is found in there. And after samadhi comes yata bhuta nyanadasana, seeing things according to reality. And again, this is one of those things that uh, I, is, is so important to point out in Buddhism. This is one of the, again, fundamental teachings of the Buddha that you find again and again in the suttas. Uh, and there you find the cause for seeing things according to reality. And of course, that is what we mean by insight. Uh, this is what we mean if you become a stream enterer, for example, a sotapanna, you have to see things according to reality. Uh, what is the cause of that? Samadhi. Yeah, right there, you have it again. Samadhi is the cause of these things. Uh, so in other words, samadhi is what enables the mind, gives the mind the power and the purity to see things in the right way and then have that insight. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, one of the things that we often talk about in Buddhism is samatha and vipassana. Uh, and uh, what does this mean in terms of samatha and vipassana? Uh, and what it really means is that uh, uh, vipassana is just really clear seeing, seeing things clearly. Uh, and samatha is calm. Uh, and you build up these two qualities, you build them up together all the way throughout the path. Yeah? And you build them up and build them up. And at some point, as you build them up, you get to samadhi. Uh, 
And at a later point, after you get to samadhi, you get to seeing things according to reality. Yeah, you can see what's going on there. So it's not, it's not that these things are not separate. They always come together. In the suttas, the Buddha always talks about samatha vipassana as one thing, one entity, one word called samatha vipassana. And as you practice this sequence, as you purify yourself, both of these qualities arise together. And as they arise, you go through all of these stages. Samadhi is one stage of samatha and vipassana. People think that samadhi is all about samatha and not about vipassana, but that's actually not true. Samadhi is called, in the suttas, it's called the alang arya nanadasana visesa, which means a distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. This is what samadhi is called, distinction in knowledge and vision. Yeah? So that too is part of the idea of vipassana and clear seeing. Yeah? So all of these things go together. Yeah? And when you look at it that way, the path is much more unified. We don't need to divide it up into samatha on the one hand, vipassana on the other. These things always go together. And what we have to do is just reduce the defilements. When you reduce the defilements, both samatha and vipassana are the consequence of that. And then you go through this entire sequence, including samadhi towards the very end. And then when you see things according to reality, then it says you have disenchantment or maybe aversion or whatever you want to call it. And then dispassion. Dispassion means that your craving ceases. No more craving because seeing things according to reality means that you see dukkha. When you see dukkha, you are no longer interested. Yeah? Because dukkha, you don't, nobody wants dukkha, so you turn away. That's what disenchantment is. Aversion, turning away in a different direction. You are repelled by what you're seeing. And then from that you gain liberation as a consequence. Sounds good, yeah? yeah. And it all happens through an automatic path. All you have to do is to purify yourself to make sure you are a good person. Yeah? So uh, you are, some of you are wearing white already, which is good. Wearing white is kind of the first degree of purity. Uh-oh, oh, I'm, tr- I'm in trouble. <laughs> <coughs> so, and then we kind of take it from there, gradually, 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 and it all happens. Uh. So let us now look at this uh, process step, stage by stage, because uh, that is uh, important as well. Uh, now we have kind of looked at a more like an overview of these things. Uh, um, so you start off with uh, virtue, yeah? and uh, as I said, virtue is very, in, in Buddhism, it's very demanding. Uh, and then when you are virtuous, then uh, you have non-regret uh, as a consequence. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, if you live well, you don't regret anything, and you don't think, oh, I shouldn't have done that, that was such a mistake, or instead you feel the exact opposite. You feel like a quiet sense of satisfaction inside of you about how you live. It is not an ego thing. It is not that you kind of go around saying, yeah, I'm the best, or anything like that. That would be terrible. That would be very kind of anti-Buddhist. It is the opposite. It's just this quiet sense of satisfaction inside of yourself. You know that you're living well. You know that your life is a good one, and for that reason, you feel that your life is worthwhile. You have a sense of natural self-esteem, a natural self-worth because of that. Yeah, this is really how you get self-worth, it's just by being kind, really. And then uh, it's, you, know, you don't care so much about what other people say anymore, because it's kind of irrelevant. You know that you're living well, other people's opinions are kind of, okay, whatever, and you kind of move on. It's not a big deal. But uh, non-regret is also more subtle than that, or regret is more subtle than that. Uh, because sometimes you don't really necessarily feel that, you know, I did something bad, I shouldn't have done it, or whatever. Uh, sometimes it's just as if the lights in your mind are dimmed a little bit. Uh, yeah? There's a little bit of darkness, a little bit of grey kind of moving into your mind. Uh, you kind of feel, you, you don't really feel that joy, some of the, uh, you know, the, the brightness that you may normally have, the energy that might be there, kind of is reduced. Uh, yeah? And this is a sign that maybe you are not as pure in your conduct as you could be. You don't feel outright regret and thinking uh, you shouldn't have done it. It's just this feeling that some of the energy is dissipated because you haven't lived up to the highest kind of standard. So this is how to understand this idea of non-regret or regret. And non-regret is then the exact opposite. is when you feel that you are living well mentally, in all ways, even with how you perceive the people around you. And then what you're doing is you're building up the energy in the mind. You start to feel bright, yeah? Because this is what happens as a consequence of feeling good about yourself. 
So at this point, what happens when you feel non-regret? If you do that fully, uh, uh, this kind of this uh, three things that tend to arise together. Mindfulness arises. Uh, mindfulness arises because when you live well, you're happy in the present moment, uh, you don't have too much ill will and desire to drag you into the past and the future. Uh, mindfulness is a natural outcome. Uh, it comes because of living well. Uh, it comes because of kindness. Uh, but what also comes is the sense of joy yeah in the mind the pamuja the joy that you know that you're living in a good way that also arises at this point uh, and the last thing that arises energy uh, the mind gets energized uh, yeah joy mindfulness and energy tend to arise together at this particular point uh. so this is how this emerges out of this idea of sila non-regret then joy comes from that uh, pamuja and at this point you already have a kind of a high degree of energy in your mind. And this is very closely related to the Anapanasati Sutta. In the Anapanasati Sutta we talk about establishing mindfulness. It is at this point that mindfulness really gets established. So it's at this point that you start watching the breath. Yeah? The breath comes into focus and the thing kind of carries on. A very close correlation between the two. And then uh, when you go, so this is really the most important part of this process. Yeah? If you can get this far, then this is where things start to become automatic. Yeah? So once you have the pamuja, you make sure that the pamuja or the gladness or the joy that you have, that it gets deepened even further. Yeah? And you do that simply by watching your meditation object, uh, by watching the breath. Uh, and as you do so, you get more joy uh, until your whole body vibrates with joy. Yeah? It's like you kind of flows, energy flowing through the body, uh, which has kind of very, very powerful, joyful experiences. Uh. And then you carry on watching the breath. All of this is about watching the breath as you do this. Uh. And as you watch the breath, then you will notice when you go to the Anapanasati Sutta, it also talks about this kind of joy as well. Yeah, the piti, uh, the Pali word for this. Uh, and that's also found there. Uh. And then uh, uh, the Anapanasati Sutta says that uh, then you tranquilize that a mental uh, activity, the pity and all of that, uh, you tranquilize it down uh, so it becomes more peaceful. Uh, again, this is an automatic process. Uh, this is exactly what we're seeing here as well. After the pity comes the pasadi, which is the tranquility. Uh, so you are kind of, first of all, you are happy, you are glad, uh, then you start bubbling with joy. You kind of, the whole body kind of uh, being, on, uh, being on this trip and you're going to feel so happy and joyful. Uh, and then you carry on with your meditation practice. Uh, and as you do that, things start to calm down. Uh, yeah? And when they calm down, the body and mind calming down, uh, it is as if you feel this deep sense of stillness and peace inside. Uh, and you feel like this rock, uh, this rock who can sit there forever and ever and ever. There's nothing else in the whole world that you want to do. Uh. I told the story on the retreat, it's just coming to mind now, uh, of uh, one of the stories that I can't remember who told me this story. Uh, but it's about Ajahn Brahm, and this was a story about Ajahn Brahm in the, from the early days when he was at Wat Nana Chat in Thailand. Uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, usually what they would do on these uh, occasions, they would, uh, especially on the, kind of the moon days, the uh, uh, post-it days, everyone would come together, the whole monastery would come together, and they would sit in meditation together, and the whole village would come as well. There would be maybe a hundred lay people there, and the, all the monks in the monastery would be out. Uh, and the monks would sit on an asana, like, like something like this, like a little bit raised platform, uh, and the people would sit on the floor, yeah? And they would all kind of be there together. Uh. And then the meditation would sometimes go a long time, sometimes a short time. Uh. At this particular time, I think it was kind of however long you want to sit. Uh. And after about an hour or so, people started to disappear. Yeah, the monks were leaving and the lay people started leaving. Uh, until there was only two people left in that hall. Uh. Those two people was Ajahn Brahm, uh, and this all the Thai lady, yeah? These old Thai ladies, they are really tough. Uh, they can sit for hours and hours, yeah? They are kind of, they are, they are just amazing. They're, they are used to this kind of, I think you're used to a certain degree of hardship, yeah? Because you have grown up, especially it was Thailand in the 1970s. It was still, still very poor. It was kind of emerging as, a, as an emerging economy. And at that time, still very, very poor. Yeah? And these were rice farmers, and they had a very simple life. So, so they were tough like nails, these old Thai ladies. Yeah? So um, she would sit there, Ajahn Brahm would sit there, yeah? And it was almost, it was like a competition who could sit the longest. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> It was not the competition who could sit the longest. It was uh, what happened was that uh, 
uh, she was watching Ajahn Brahm, yeah, because Ajahn Brahm was sitting there, yeah, and she had never seen a monk sitting so still before her. Yeah. He was absolutely still. There was no sign of anything. There was no sign of life. There was no breath. There was absolutely nothing going on. Yeah. And as I said at the retreat, uh, uh, even the mosquitoes were confused uh, because the mosquitoes, uh, they were kind of going around and around Ajahn Brahm. They didn't know, is this a rock, is it a tree, is it a human being? And trying to find out, uh, round and round, uh, they could never settle down. Uh, so he was so still that he confused everyone. Uh, so this Thai lady was watching him. Uh, and then after a while, after three or four hours or whatever, she thought, uh, you know, she sort of would be getting, getting a bit concerned. Uh, so she got up, uh, she left the hall, she found some of the other monks, and she said, there's a dead monk in the hall. Uh. <laughs> 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 so this is what happened when you get really tranquil in meditation. Uh, yeah, you become like a dead person to the external world uh, because everything comes down and becomes so peaceful uh, that nothing really, there's no external signs anymore of you actually being alive. Uh. Yeah, everything comes down and they say in the suttas that when the meditation is deep enough, uh, your breath stops. I don't know if there's any medical doctors here, well, actually there is at least one, but uh, so, uh, and you may wonder how is that possible if your breath stops surely you will die but the point is that everything stops your metabolism stops and because your metabolism stops uh, there's no need for any oxygen anymore if no need for oxygen no need to breathe yeah that's essentially what seems to be happening in these deep states uh. so fortunately Ajahn Brahm survived that ordeal so he then he he carried on and now he is uh, we, he's still around and still helping out uh. so that is the tranquility and you can imagine when you feel that degree of peace, that degree of stability in your meditation, it is extraordinarily pleasant. Uh, it is almost as if you are moving towards discovering the meaning of life. Uh, there's nothing to drive you anymore, there's no desire to do anything. And when there's no desire to do anything, uh, when you're so happy, so content, uh, it is basically the definition of the meaning of life. Uh, because there's nothing more to be done, there's nothing more to achieve, because you feel that you have achieved everything in the present moment completely, fully content with what is going on here. And that is a very, very profound state of happiness. Uh, yeah? And then that happiness is what draws you in to samadhi. And that is where the most profound samadhi can happen as a consequence. Uh, the jhanas and way beyond uh, happen because of that. Uh. So this is uh, the, this path. And uh, this is what this uh, sutta is about. Uh, and this is how it, uh, how it works. Uh, and uh, all you really have to do is to establish that virtue at the very beginning. Uh, and if you do that properly, then this path is going to happen for you too. Uh. Yeah, it's not as hard as it sounds. Uh. It's not about how you watch the breath. Uh. It's not about the technique you use in meditation. It's actually about all the other things. Uh. It is about how you live your life. That is by far the most important thing. Uh. Everything else happens as a matter, as a consequence of that. Uh. And. Uh, I've got a few minutes left. As I mentioned at the beginning, there is a, a very strong correlation between this particular sutta and uh, the suttas uh, of Anapanasati, of mindfulness of breathing. Uh, and if you remember the Anapanasati sutta, it starts off by saying that you establish mindfulness in front of you, Satting Parimukkang Upatapetva, that I mentioned this morning. Uh, yeah? And this is similar here to the stage of non-regret. Uh, yeah, mindfulness is established. Uh, and once you have mindfulness established, uh, that is when you start watching the breath. Uh, you watch the long breath, the short breath, uh, then you watch the whole breath, yeah, from beginning to end. Uh, mindfulness is getting stronger uh, as you practice this. Uh, and then, uh, once mindfulness becomes fairly strong, uh, it also starts to calm down. Uh, yeah, this is called the, uh, this is called the um, Kaya Sankarang Patisambeti or something like that. Mm. Okay, something like that. Uh. So you get to calming down the breath and everything starts to become peaceful. Uh. And the next stage then in the Anapanasati is where the piti starts to arise. Yeah? Uh, piti patisang vedeti, you experience patisang vedi, you experience piti as part of a meditation practice. Uh. Again, in parallel to this one here. Uh. And sometimes it is that movement, moving from the uh, calming down the breath when everything starts to feel really nice and peaceful already, Moving from that to the pity can sometimes be the part that is a little bit tricky here. 
And that is what I mentioned this morning when I said about uh, uh, this last factor that is often missing in the meditation, uh, is the ability to give rise to the joy. Uh, and that is where you need to encourage yourself a little bit, uh, yeah, to bring in a little bit of metta, to bring in a little bit of uh, just appreciating of gratitude of the present moment, uh, being able to be in a good place with good people, uh, and bringing that up. Uh, and that then you can carry on with feeling experience in the PT. Uh. And then the Anapanasati Sutta says that from that you then have the Sukha Patisangvedi, uh, yeah, experiencing of happiness. Uh, the happiness is always more profound than the PT. Uh. And then you have Chitta Sankharang Patisang Vedi. Chitta Sankharang is the mental, your mental activity. So you experience that mental activity. It's basically the same thing we've just been talking about now. Then you calm down the mental activity. You calm down the feelings and perceptions that you have. And then when they calm down, you have happiness and stillness coming, coming together. These are the two kind of hallmarks of deep meditation. On the one hand, you are very, very still and extremely peaceful. Uh, on the other hand, you feel a very profound sense of happiness. Uh, and these are the two things you should look out for in a meditation practice, uh, especially when it goes well. Uh, yeah? These two things, the increase uh, in profound happiness uh, combined with the calm and the, and the uh, uh, pasadi, the tranquility of the mind. Uh, those two things coming together, this is what proves, if you like, uh, the power of meditation. Uh. Then, when that calms down, uh, then the next one is the citta, uh, citta's patisangvedi, I think. Um, something like that, it's experiencing the mind, uh, yeah? And this is really where you start to go into the mental world more completely, uh, where you leave the body behind, you leave all the other the senses behind, uh, and you start to emerge into the world of the mind itself. Uh. And this is where things like uh, uh, visions start to arise, mental visions, uh, not visions that have anything to do with sight, uh, but have to do with the mind itself. Uh, that is why it is called Chitta Patisangvedi. Uh, chitta Sankharang Chitta, one of those, doesn't, doesn't really matter. Uh, so you're experiencing the mind, yeah? And this is very similar here to some of the higher aspects of the path that you see here, where you start to become very peaceful and tranquil, and you start to experience Sukha, profound Sukha. The mind is coming into its own right. Uh, you see these things that we call samadhi nimittas. Uh, you see the sun and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, and then you gladden that mind. Uh, yeah, this is one of these things here. You gladden it to make that nimitta bright. Uh, then you uh, make it more peaceful. You still it by focusing on it in the right way with peace. Uh, and eventually you liberate the mind. Uh, chittang, uh, vimochayang chittang is the last one. Uh, and Vimochyang Chittang is where you enter that state of Samadhi. It's equivalent to the Samadhi aspect here. Huh? Yeah, and that is how the Anapanasati sequence goes. Huh? And then when you have finished those 12 st stages of, of Anapanasati, then you also have four more stages. Huh? And these are the Anicca anu Anupasi, huh? and the Viraga Anupasi, the Nirodha Anupasi, and the Patinisiga Anupasi. And this is all about investigating what you have been through in terms of wisdom, huh? in terms of understanding. Huh? So you look back on that sequence. Yeah, this is where insights can happen in a very profound sense. Uh, you look back on that sequence uh, and you see that the things you have been through, through are impermanent, they are dukkha, they are problematic. Uh, and from that you can see things according to reality. Again, exactly what you find here in this particular sequence. Uh, so you see things according to reality. What is that you see according to reality? What you see is that you see how your body disappears, yeah? how your five senses disappear, they are anicca, they are viraga, they fade away, they are niroda, they eventually disappear. Yeah? You see how the five hindrances do exactly the same thing. Yeah? You see how your will, how the movement of the mind gradually disappears and fades away. Yeah? All of these things, you see them in real time. Yeah? You have seen this in real time. This is why this is so powerful. And then you're able to, on, based on that, uh, to get profound insights. Uh. And eventually, as you keep on cultivating that, uh, again and again and again, seeing these things again and again and again, uh, then you get what is said here, the uh, uh, viraga, the dispassion. You're no longer interested. Uh. Viraga here is synonymous with patinisaga. You let go of everything. When you let go of everything, it means craving dies down. You have no longer have any interest in that. Uh. Craving is gone. Uh. And when you don't have any craving anymore, you are liberated as a consequence. Uh. So that is, in very, in very, very briefly, how the Anapanasati Sutta matches up with this particular sequence. Uh. Usually I spend two hours at least on the Anapanasati Sutta, but uh, there is very similar themes, so it's kind of uh, 
you know, when you understand one, you also understand the other. Uh, but uh, these are all very beautiful teachings. Uh. So, uh, have a look at these things uh, yourself uh, and see what, uh, what they do for you. Uh. And uh, often when you read other suttas, you will see how they compare with this particular sutta, how all of these suttas have very similar themes uh, and how you develop the same kind of qualities uh, and see how astonishingly inspiring and interesting this Buddhist path is. Uh, it is full of happiness, it is full of all these wonderful and remarkable states uh, that all of us can experience. Uh, all you have to do is to live your life well uh, and as a consequence of that all of these things tend to happen. Uh, and uh, so please when you meet your mates who are not uh, convinced Buddhist yet, uh, tell them also, not, tell them not just about Dukkha, yeah, tell them about Sukkha as well. Uh, and then there is a chance they might kind of come around and say, yeah, Buddhism, this is the way. Uh, this is what I thought when I read this, I thought, wow, why doesn't anyone teach me about this? Uh, this is just so cool, yeah. This is what I, everything I ever want to get in my life, uh, and I'm sure that is the case for most people. Uh, and uh, so it's a very positive, uplifting, and great message. Yeah. So, uh, that is about it. And uh, so one of these little suttas, uh, and uh, let's have a short break, uh, about 15 minutes or so, uh, come back, do some meditation together, and then do some Q&A at the very end. Uh.